Well, we are going to have a Q&A panel alongside some of my favorite people. We got, once again, Pastor Anthony Wood, Pastor Costi, and then this is Pastor Anthony's wife, Bree. She is a homeschool mother of three and a contributor to For the Gospel Ministries. This is going to be a great time. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, the way this is going to work is many of you have submitted questions. I'm going to ask some of those questions. And as you guys feel led or really just want to get in there, you, there's no assigned person for each question so we can hop on in. First question is important. It's really my question, not yours. Hypothetically, uh, you're dating someone. It's going well. Uh, you feel like they love the Lord. Six months in, you find out they like cats. Is it a deal breaker? Dump them. Yeah. Um, that would, uh, yeah. So this is case in point why you guys need to live your life with wise men and women. Amen? Dump them. Hyphen, Costi Hen. Now. Uh, Do not quote that on social <laughs> okay. media. Okay, let me get started for reals this time. Now, I would like to ask you guys, what is an appropriate age uh, to begin dating or a courtship, how old should someone be? What are your thoughts there? Anyway. Everybody's going to look at the dad and the mom with teenagers <laughs> who are in the middle of doing it and doing a great job. We've all been observing you very closely. <laughs> but why don't you guys give us some wisdom? Well, I'll jump in. Um, I think it will depend for the ladies who your authority is. And so what I mean by that is first, as daughters of the king, we would all agree that our authority is God and his word. And Proverbs 4, 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever you do get, get insight. But how often do we let our emotions instead um, tell us what to do? And we need to ask godly wisdom before we meet Prince Charming uh, so that we can be found with those that are wise and not foolish and be left in a puddle of tears and often uh, lifelong consequences. And so the follow-up question would be, uh, whom do I seek wisdom from? Who is my authority? And for the young women who are still at home with their parents, I want to read uh, some words from Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long on earth. Now, I confess, I sin greatly, um, especially in high school and college, and uh, there was a good amount of time where I hid it from my parents, and I would say the, the one moment that I remember the most was when I came to them, and I confessed what I had done first, of course, to the Lord, um, but also to them, because how can I ask my dad uh, to lead me if he doesn't know how he needs to. And um, I'll never forget shortly after, he met a young man at the front door with a shotgun. And um, I, I just, I wouldn't change that because it was the first time I truly remember just being underneath his leadership. And, um, but the reality is, you know, in today's era, uh, many of us come from broken homes, and those of you who may not have a Christian father or a godly role model, uh, Hebrews 13 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And so your pastors are another authority in your life. And Proverbs tells us over and over to seek many counselors. And so if there's godly families in your church, in your community that you can just learn from, sit under, um, see from their example. Uh, but coming back to the question, um, dear sisters in the faith, I would highly encourage you uh, to go to the authorities in your life and literally as soon as possible and come up with a game plan to uh, answer this question for you. It's really good. So when is it appropriate to begin? Does it feel good to have that done? The first one. I know your heart's beating so fast. Oh, she's, it's hard to be up front, isn't it? 
This I is love not you my so role. Much. <laughs> you did so good. You did so good. Um, the only the only thing that I could even think to add, just just to, in my mind, I simplify it. When is it appropriate? I don't. I think sometimes we get ultra caught up on age, right? But historically, ages have changed. You go back two thousand years to first century. You know, Judea, and you're talking people married at 14 or 13 or 15. And so we don't take that and just jump over to the, the, the time bridge to America and say, I don't tell my daughter, hey, 14 is it, right? So it's not really age as much as it's stage. And there's sociocultural realities there as well. And stage would be, we go to the Bible, and I would, you know, I tell my kids, I say, well, uh, what stage are you at as a woman? Are you ready to manage a home? Are you ready to care for your husband? I tell my, my son, I say, are you ready to protect and to provide for a young woman? Are you ready to pay the bills? Are you ready to make sure uh, that your entire family has a vision set for them and knows how to execute on that vision? Uh, and, and the reality is you can have a 30-year-old guy, it's really not age, a 30-year-old guy who's a total goofball show up, and his age makes him look good, but he has absolutely nothing in order and doesn't know the word of God. And then you could have a 17-year-old who's been properly trained. He's got his life together. He's ready to give me my dowry and take my daughter away and treat her right. And I'm like, she's yours. So it, to me, I wouldn't put age on it. I would look at the character of the heart, and then I would know that that's the right man for my daughter or my woman for my son. I don't know if that's helpful. No, that's helpful. What, well, especially with the dowry, what are you, what are you considering there? Uh, another time. Um, a real dowry. Yeah. I want you to pay for my girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nine camels. Leave and cleave. She's leaving me and cleaving <laughs> nine you. Nine camels. You need to, yeah. Oh, okay. oh yeah. No, no, no. Now, uh, our next question, Kasi, you can answer this one, is how long should a dating couple wait before deciding to get married or even pursuing marriage? It's a good question. We were talking about some of this on the patio actually earlier with a few people. They had a good pop question, which now we get to address it. Uh, you want to be careful saying hard and fast, you know, within three months, six months, one year, two years. I'll tell you this though, biblically, there is two springtimes in the Song of Solomon. I don't know if we mentioned that in our sessions. I didn't. There's two spring times mentioned. Now you can take that as a hard and fast rule and go, oh, that's it. You know, once two springs have gone by, or from spring to spring, one year. But let's just say this. Just like we don't mandate, you know, you better give 10% tithing or else. You know, New Testament giving is not mandated 10% law. It's generosity and free will giving. But as a principle, some people say, well, where should I start or what should I do? And so some people will say, I use 10% as a principle or as a baseline for a conversation Let's say you take the Old Testament poetic narrative that we just walked through. There's a springtime that it starts at and a springtime that it finishes at mentioned in the book. And you could say, by way of principle, the goal I would aim for is about a one-year process somewhere in there. Now, that's not from the time that you meet them because we already talked about it earlier in your session. You could spend three to six months getting to know the inside of someone. I think, what would you say? You could have a hard shell but a weird nut. Or a nice shell, a hot shell, sorry. The best analogy of the whole conference. You could have a, a hot shell, but a weird nut. Meaning the outside, hey, that looks good. Inside, you don't know what you're getting. So you want to get to know the inside of a man's heart. So some point leading up to this spring-to-spring -spring process by way of principle, because I know people want practical roadmaps, and then everyone likes to run with that and apply it. You get to know someone, and then you spend some months in a courtship process formally, and then it might be good if somewhere around that three to six month process, we know where we're heading and what's going to happen next. A ring goes on a finger. And then from there, like, what are you going to do? Stay engaged for two years and get tempted and burn with passion? And why? Because you have to have a 45, 50, 60, $200,000 wedding. Get on with it. Looking back, I would have just married my wife in a backyard a lot faster and cheaper and got on with it. So I think somewhere in there, just practically speaking, You've met with your parents, your pastor, everything's clear. It looks like what we've walked through for the past three sessions and four sessions. And so at that point, plan the wedding, do some practicalities, get it going, and then get on with it. So that would be my advice. If you just used spring to spring as a, as a boundary marker from the Song of Solomon, what else are you going to do for so two to three? So everybody who got married in winter are in sin. Totally. December weddings, you blew it. Is that what you... Yeah. 
Ring Ring by Spring is from Song of Solomon. So yeah, apparently. Ring by Spring. Does that make sense though? Yeah. So question, Just, the follow up question would be: Let's say you're in a relationship though for six months, and there's still a prolonged uncertainty. Would you then say that prolonged uncertainty is certainty? So, like, if you're saying, hey, well, I've been with this person for eight months, I still don't know, would you then take that as, well, then you do know if there's that sort of, un, you know, ambiguity there? Yeah, so let's fast forward. My daughter, Grace, or Ruth, is in that position, and there's some guy, and he's been around, and we think he's nice, but it's not happening. By then, well before then, at least in our home, we would have had the DTR moment way before. You're not getting to eight months of dating my daughter without clarity, we're going to know where it's going. And if you don't know, then it's just, well, let's pray and wait and come on over for barbecues and I'll disciple you. You don't get her, but you can have me. Um, and, and then we'll walk together. But if we're ready, we're ready. So eight months in, if there's uncertainty, I would just ask, you know, my daughter, so what is it? I mean, he's nice. We, he's from the church. It's Pastor Tony's son. Like, what's the deal? Come on. You know, these are nice people. What's it's a 10-year going... gap there. So. No, no, no. He's got another son that's oh, okay, right in the that, same okay. age range as my daughter, Grace. I mean, this we'll take like it. like a Ruth and Boaz situation. We'll, I will pay the dowry. Dowry, 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 dowry. dowry. Done. done, done, done. A bunch of pomegranates. But okay. let's just say it wasn't clicking. We need to have a conversation, and maybe the daughter or the son is like, I feel pressured, or I, I, it's just not, I don't know, I'm not sure. Then we need to stop. We need to pray. So it's way more simple and way more obvious than I think we make it. But in our American context, everyone sort of floats around in weirdness. And then we get our hearts attached. Again, back to that second session. When our heart gets attached too soon, we've crossed a line. Now we have to break our own heart. We have to parents and in -law, future in-laws. Things get weird and emotional. So the, whole, the reason why I do a conference like this is because we want to start the journey the right way so that we don't get to eight months in and we don't even have any clarity, we should have had clarity before the process began. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. One of the things you just said is that things can get emotional. Now, when I say the word boundaries, the first thing that would come to your mind is physical boundaries. Much less is said about emotional boundaries. Those are important. My next question for you guys is, what are the necessary precautions and lines that should be drawn in a dating relationship in regards to a boyfriend or girlfriend beginning to operate almost as if they're husband and wife. You know, a guy on a quest of intentionality can start telling his girlfriend of two months, I need to wash you with the word, and they begin to operate like a husband prematurely. What are the lines that should be drawn in just an emotional sense as well as they try to operate within a healthy and godly way? I would say for the ladies um, to work really hard at not wanting to do anything exclusively. So a way that we can stay away from exclusivity physically would be to have a chaperone. Now, I get it. That totally puts me as a mom from the 1950s right now. I see everybody's blank stares. But I think um, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says it best that very clearly were to flee from sexual immorality. And in the Bible also tells us that, you know, when there is temptation, he will give us a way out. And um, this is different. And so we're literally to run from it. And so often when this type of temptation comes is when what? We're alone, right? And so whether it be a sibling, a friend, a mentor, my encouragement would be to find someone. The key is to find someone who cares about your purity as much as they care about their own. And they're with you uh, all the time. And um, being able to have that will prayerfully save you uh, from many uh, situations that would make you compromise. But also, it would provide a goal of inclusivity, you know, for your relationship. It, it would prayerfully allow you to have... Um, an agenda to serve rather than just, you know, the, the status quo of just entertainment constantly. Um, another way that we can ha strive for, you know, not having exclusivity emotionally and spiritually um, is to let the voice, his voice, be one of many in your life. 
And so um, until he puts a ring on your finger, he's not the authority in your life, as we talked about um, previously. Uh, so we don't want to mislead them into thinking that they are. And, um, you know, as far as reading the word together, praying together, uh, there's great things that you can do, but he's one voice of many. So I would come back to that word exclusivity for the, for the gals. Pastor Anthony, so if a guy comes up to you, and, and thank you, Bree, that was really clear. Let's say a guy comes up to you, he's been dating for a few months, I'm just thinking out loud, and he goes, well, every week we meet at Starbucks at 5.30 in the morning, and we read and pray. So even if it's one voice amongst many, would you say wise, unwise? What would your input be there? I read with her, and I put my hand across the table. I grab hers, and I say, oh, God, unite yeah. us with a <laughs> love for you. <laughs> with anybody else's daughter, but not mine. Yeah, I, now, here, here's the, my, my simple answer on this is, is that what lines, the word that comes to my mind as a dad is anything that signals possession, and that can be a ton of things. That You can do spiritual things in a possessive way, right? Now, the obvious ones that come to mind is, you know, slinging your arm around, around her, you know, with your pants down around your ankles and that whole thing they do, you know. You see that at the beach all the time. The reality is, is that the Bible says she's going to leave me and cleave to you. And you don't own her. She's the Lord's. And so anything that you do that signals that you own her, that she's your possession or property, is off limits. Even if it means that I'm going to have my Bible study with you and you're going to listen to me and I'm going to be your leader. No, not yet. You walk down the aisle, you make a covenant between the two of you and the living God, and then you have the right to signal possession. So I'd have a whole list of things that would fall in that category. On, on, a, on, a, on a macro level, here's the way that I view it. In fact, I didn't get to this in the session two, which I would have. It would have been a good practical application. We talked about the desire stage, the depth stage, the devotion stage. We went through those lists. What I, what I would say is you, know, you do the, the desire stage when you're attraction. You're doing that in the church context. That's what it's for. You're watching them. How do they serve? Who do they hang with? How do they treat their parents? The whole deal. That's happening in a macro context. And then you do the actual depth stage, getting to know them with the family. To Bree's point, I want to be with the family. I want him in my home. If you want to date her and call it that, that's fine. But that means you're dating all of us, to your point too, Costi. And then you do the devotion stage with, with chaperones. So every single one of those stages is always done in a public way that never signals that you have any hold upon her heart that you have yet to walk the aisle and commit to. Uh, and I could go through, it, it would take forever. We could just go through a ton of bullet points on those. I always picture it like a castle. He's riding up to the castle and he's the knight in shining armor. And he's got to prove that he, he has to prove that he's worthy of me walking my princess out that drawbridge and handing her to him. And until he does, he doesn't get to ride off with her anywhere by themselves. He can come into my castle, he can sit around my table, and he can win her heart, but he ain't going to do it on his own. That's helpful. Yeah, I think uh, even what, with what you said, Bree, there's a difference between being a spiritual example to your girlfriend than being the spiritual leader in her life. And, and that's something everyone needs to understand the great difference between and what you said regarding ownership is insightful. So thank you. My next question is, um, as we talk about boundaries, boundaries, um, if, if we're being real here, have been crossed in the past by different people in a relationship. So what are the necessary or practical steps that someone should take after entering into sexual sin in a relationship, what would be first thing, second thing that they should do after recognizing that sin, being convicted over it? Where should they go? Who should they talk to? What would be your input there? I'll throw one initial step. First of all, you've crossed the boundary, you've sinned. So you got to confess your sin. With that, you're, you're breaking up. And I know that seems intense for our modern context, but you've basically proven that you're not ready. It's not time. You've awakened love. You've crossed in boundaries. And, you know, it's not like a fender bender, like, oh, oops, <laughs> we'll keep driving. You, 
you're done. So we got to take a break. And then the goal isn't to condemn and hammer people and go, yeah, you better now go do this. And the goal is to be restored to a holistic holiness before God, not to get her back, not to get him back, but to make it right with the Lord. So you're going to confess that sin. And then the relationship's done. You clearly need discipleship. You need to grow, and then you need protection. So we're back to chaperones. We're back to pastors. We're back to that process. And goodness, I mean, join the club, I'm sure, of many people who have made mistakes and sinned and didn't follow the process and had to be apart for some time only to come back together and watch God do it the right way. That's good. The goal is restoration. But again, you're, you're not going to get restored on your own terms. Like, yeah, all right, we're, we're good, though. Trust me. Now that we confess this, we are really serious this time. Awesome. Well, you're going to be seriously alone for now. And then we're going to get you back in the saddle together the right way. So I confess that sin, break up. Now we walk together to go there, if that makes sense. Yeah, so let's say, Costi, someone comes up to you and says, I hear you saying break up, but I counter you with the Bible says if we burn with passion, we should just get married. Uh, what if they kind of reacted to that and say, maybe you should just get this thing done right now? What would be your response to a young man or young woman? Yeah, if you've got habitual sin, we want to talk about that. Uh, why you crossed the line in the first place so you, you're not very submissive already. Um, do you have issues with sexual temptation that are linked to pornography or other desires and you couldn't control yourself? So we need to talk about all of those discipleship issues. Now, the burning with passion conversation is a good one. I think there's some people that have had engagements that have walked with in counseling that were engaged for far too long as they thought oh well with this and then all of a sudden things start happening and because God's design was meant not for people to have four year long engagements they're supposed to get to it so you'd have to talk to that but the counter I don't know the guy's heart whoever this is hypothetically but yeah I mean I remember when I was that age one time and my goal was to get the thing I wanted so I did whatever it took like a little lawyer working my way around the system I think at that point I would just say, brother, you already blew it, man, and I want to walk with you and help restore you. Right now, you're not exhibiting a, a great level of submission. So let's restart together, and then let's get you back where you need to be. But I, that's, I don't know. We'd have a strong conversation, him and I alone, yeah. at that point if you're trying to wiggle out of it. No, that's, that's helpful, I think, for, for many people because I think sometimes people take the Scripture out of context to justify what they want. Uh, rather than obeying a principle of Scripture within its context. And, and those things can be easily misunderstood or, or taken and received in a way that's if, inappropriate. If, if that's how it works, then you, you sleep with a girl, you cross a boundary, then you, you confess that, and you'll go, yeah, we, you should get married. People would do that just to get married faster all the time. It doesn't work that way. So, no, it's helpful. Our, our next question is, you know, Pastor Tony, you had touched on just the the element of spiritual leadership. It's not ownership in dating, but there should be some sort of a, a reciprocal na a nature of the way that they challenge and shape one another, at least by example. Let's say in a relationship, and Bree, you can speak to this as well, the girl has more biblical knowledge than the guy does. Uh, what should this mean for them as they're seeking input or guidance? Let's say there's a young lady here who's interested in a guy, he has a heart for the Lord, but doesn't know much about God's word. And she grew up in a very solid environment. And she's worried, how can this guy spiritually lead me when I know more than him? What would be your input and wisdom there? I'll let you go second because you'll have a lot to say, I'm sure. In this scenario, in this scenario, are we talking, are they already married or not married? Uh, let's say they're dating. Yeah. See, that one's really easy. I'll just talk to the men. You can talk to the gals. You know, you, you have... Men, you need to know, Ephesians 5, right, you wash her with the word. How do you wash someone if you don't have the soap, you don't have the water, right? You, you, you have to know that. And so, gentlemen, that's the whole point of being a Bible man and spending your entire young journey and sitting there and getting in the word every single morning and being broken before the Lord and learning his word. You're actually learning his word, not just for yourself, but so that you can carry a wonderful woman of God and a family through the trials and the consternations of this life. That's part of your calling as a man. 
and a part of your calling as a husband. And so absolutely 100%, if you need to take online courses, if you need to go to your pastor and ask for one-on-one discipleship, if you need to leave your, your, your funky, you know, woke folk, seekers-driven church, and you need to go get into a real Bible teaching church, do it. Um, before you walk down the aisle and you take her hand in marriage, you must make sure that you can protect that woman spiritually. You can guide her spiritually. And by the way, understand, this whole idea that washing someone in the word is we sit around and we do devotionals together and, and we make, you know, and, and we pray and we hold hands and the couple who prays together stays together and all that stuff. That's not what, it, that's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul's talking about in that text is he's saying that when you marry someone, you want to be able, when they're going through something, to get them to the key text at the key time. So you want to know the Bible well enough in a rubric that when your wife is going through things, you're not just going, well, I don't know what to do. I think, I feel, maybe we should go find a counselor. No, it's your responsibility as a man to know the text well enough so that when she has questions, when she has hurts, when she has pains, when she has fears, when she has anxieties, when she has jealousies, when she's angry, you're able to open up the Bible and say, honey, what does God say about that? Which precludes, by the way, that you've married a Christian woman. If she doesn't have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter how much you open up the Word. It ain't going to work because you don't have the Holy Spirit in there who's regenerated her and made it possible, which goes back to each of the sessions. So I think from a, just answering from a male's perspective, absolutely 100%, uh, which is why it's so important, men, right now to get things squared away uh, with the Lord. But that would be my answer to the men. Can I, can I just piggyback one and then brief just one more thing? Sure. One of the most helpful things you just pointed out can help a young woman and her family discern if a guy is faking it or not. Here's what I mean by that. I grew up in the era of college. So did you. Dude with the guitar and the bare feet on the beach, like, yeah, and he could sing a little Chris Tomlin, and he's suckering in these women acting spiritual. Do you have a Chris Tomlin song for us? Uh, I'll sing it with you. Yeah. Kick it off. What do you got? I don't know. How great is our God? How great Johnny. Is okay, we're God. moving on. Um, <laughs> I just was wondering, Here, I haven't here's, heard it. Here's keep my going. point. Don't derail the train right yeah, now. Keep going. We stay on the train. You, anybody, any dude with a guitar and his hoodie at Huntington, like, yeah, with the fire pit, right? Number one, no offense, fellas. If you're a good man, God bless you with your fire pit worship stuff. But That would be a great name for a Christian band, the fire pit. Yeah. Fire pit boys, you and I. Okay, but stay with me here. Listen. I grew up in the era of this too. I was, I was at Dallas Baptist and we're so spiritual and they would use spiritual means to try to lure in the ladies to take possession too early. When I was around, it was everybody was going through crazy love to get Francis Chan. Like, girl, I want to meet you at Starbucks. We're just doing this study together and we'll go through crazy love and open your Bible. Okay, listen, any dude can take you through a study and act spiritual while he's reading it with you. That's what you're helping us discern. It's not going through a little devotional at Starbucks. It's the ability for a Bible man to wield the sword on demand, anytime, any moment, when she's emotional, frustrated, has questions. Any dude can buy a Lifeway study and hang with you over a latte and fool you. A real Bible man who's ready will go, yeah, that reminds me, you know, we got to just rejoice always. You know, like Paul says, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, and it's all circumstances. And, you know, our God is sovereign. Like, Rattling off the Bible, preparing. So I don't know if you realize how helpful that is for that whole demographic of boy band Christians that play the game and act spiritual, but they don't know what they're doing without some feeder at Starbucks while they touch your daughter's hand and take possession. Not on your watch. Dowry. Yep. I think that helps explain as far as boyfriend, girlfriend are concerned uh, if the case is not that way, and say you are already married, um, in our culture, that's often the case. Fellow sisters, we want to be um, walking in such a way what scripture calls us to. So Ephesians 5, we know we're supposed to submit to our husbands, but in verse 33, it talks about how we're to respect our husbands. And um, looking in my keyword study Bible, this was a verse that I went to early on in our marriage. And it was so helpful because the definition can sometimes be 
differing in this room and in each person's worldview and how they're, they're seeing that. But uh, in the Bible, it showed to be morally fear, to show moral fear, revere, and honor. And it's a present subjunctive tense, meaning it's a continuous action on the wife's part. And the only reason I say that is so that we're all on the same page as we're moving forward. Uh, But some applications from this verse might be, you know, if I revere my husband, am I admiring him? Am I encouraging him in the righteousness that I do see in his life? Uh, If I honor my husband, am I giving him special recognition, uh, meeting his needs and lifting him up? If I healthily fear him, Um, I'm going to be wanting to be slower to speak, quicker to listen. Uh, When he does ask me to do something, I want to be quick to action. And um, in that, I think, you know, our husbands, are if they're asking us to do something in direct opposition to God's word, that's where it would be different. And we need to go, again, to the authority of the word and humbly uh, show them their error. And I think Matthew 18 directs us in uh, a game plan if we come to them and we show them their error uh, through the word and they don't respond in such a way that we bring someone with us to help. And in that case, you know, bringing a pastor or your church involved. And prayerfully, we don't have to get to that point, but God gives it to us in the case that we do. Um, so all that to say, I think, you know, our, our role doesn't change as a wife. Uh, we still want to follow that scriptural knowledge, but it's important that we show it. Uh, we don't have to, to state it. And I've seen several women through the years at our church who have lived this out. And the beauty that comes from their obedience to God's word often is what draws their husbands to seek him more. And it's been so neat to see that. That's really helpful. Thank you, Bree. Now, my next question for you guys is, how should I or how should someone here or listening go about setting standards? And we've touched on this to a certain degree in the sessions and in things you've already said so far. How should we go about setting standards for what to look for in a husband or wife? And I think I want to add even just an element onto that question. You've mentioned looking for someone that is a Christian is obviously a prerequisite. I'd also like to just have you touch on what is the difference between someone who claims Christ and someone who is currently and actively being shaped by God? And, and how do we go about setting those proper standards? What would you guys say? Kasi, we'll start with you. Yeah, I would. So I joked about it, kind of funny, the opening session of what guys and gals had put on their top 10 list when we did this with some college young adult students. It was funny. It was good. But the exercise itself can be really helpful. I'm not saying it has to be 10. It could be 15. It could be 20. It could be 4. But... I would make some sort of list objectively in a journal or whatever. What are you looking for? And then with those things you're looking for, can you attach some spiritual significance to it? And hopefully the series we've walked through this weekend would show you that you physical attraction can be on there to say that I want him to be handsome. I want to like looking at this guy every day. We've studied that is biblical. That's right. Look at that. So make a list that is based on the whole counsel of God. Uh, you've got a man that's godly, et cetera. So I would make a Bible list for both genders. You know, if you're a girl, for a guy, if you're a guy, for a gal that you want to marry. And what was your other, what was the other side of the question? I, I just, I think that so many people say, hey, well, yeah, she knows God. Oh, yeah, how do you know? Yeah, I just think that there should be some sort of an element included where you're ascertaining, no, she is currently, or he is oh, currently yeah, being totally. shaped. We we wrote an article about this. You've written on this. I've written on this. We've written on it. We have, on for the gospel, a list of how do you know if you're saved. And the reason is because people ask this question all the time. I think we listed 10 things on there. And so you could do two things. Read that article. It's on there. And you could just see if the person looks like that. But more specifically, I would read through 1 John. Just read through 1 John and see, are they habitually habitually obedient? Are they walking in love? Do they confess Christ? Do they have a pattern of submission to his word in not just word but deed? Do they serve, et cetera? So I'd look at what the Bible says a Christian is and use that, which is very offensive sometimes in today's culture, 
When people say, oh, you can't judge my heart. You don't know me. I'm a Christian. Romans 10, 9. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Well, the Bible also says that if the Holy Spirit's taken residence in you, there's going to be this stuff called fruit. And it's going to look like this. You go over to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and you start walking through, look at their life. If it's not there, you're allowed to say what you said in your session when you literally looked at a group of men and said, if this is happening habitually in your life, you're on your way to hell. So let's get right with the Lord. Don't believe me? Let me prove it. And you went to Paul, to Corinth, and then Christ in Matthew 5. So we're allowed to do that. We want to do that. Two things will result. Number one, you will get your spouse, which is fun. Yay, they're saved. Let's go. Two, you may lead someone to Christ that you may never lead to the altar. But by showing them that, somebody might find that they're a false convert and not a Christian. So we walk in obedience, we focus on faithfulness, and the Lord will determine the rest of the process. That's helpful, Costi. Now, just one thing, Pastor Tony, I want you to highlight briefly. You know, we we mentioned just a, a pattern of obedience, and previously we had talked about a biblical knowledge. You know, we live in an environment where people can watch a YouTube video and um, kind of obtain information about the, go- the, the gospel and God's word. Um, and for many people, they've divorced their life from actual discipleship. They can accumulate information about truth, but today, rarely, I mean, how many people do you know that are being actively discipled by an older godly man or woman in their church? So talk about that need for discipleship as we ascertain where they're at spiritually and as we look at where they're at biblically. Okay. Um, well, I, I, want, I just want to keep it simple, it, you know, because I already talked a little bit about it. But you, we could add a ton of more, you know, a, a ton more passages in Ephesians 5, 5 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. I mean, the idea of an ongoing sinful immorality is just antithetical to the idea of being a Christian. So it, it's across the pages of the New Testament, uh, which would lead you, you know, back to, to your question discipleship is is the key to everything. It's the great commission. It's the signature of a believer, the idea that you're growing. Uh, if someone intellectually assents to the gospel but has no volitional response to the gospel, if the gospel never starts in the head and travels 12 inches to the heart and transforms the will. I mean, everyone knows in the Bible a thousand times, cardia, the idea of a heart or leb in the Old Testament. It, it, there's four basic segments that you see, the idea of the heart, the soul, the mind, the strength. You've got the top end, which is the mind, and the truth of Christianity goes into the mind. And then what it does is it goes into the mind and then it begins to transform the will. And once it transforms the will and the way that you live, ultimately that changes your affections. That's why true Christianity starts with the mind and then culminates and changes how you feel about things, whereas false Christianity, like Bethel and stuff that we've written about, flips that upside down. It's all about the emotions. You come in, you close your eyes, you wiggle around, and you think something's happening with a bunch of hazers in the wall. And the reality is, is then you're hoping that leaks into your mind and changes. That's not the way God designed things. And so what we want to remember is that the gospel transforms my mind, which then changes my life. I'm not just a hearer of the word. I'm an effectual doer of the word. And so what you're looking at, Romans 12, 1 and 2, when you meet a spouse, is you're trying to meet someone who actually is a doer of the word. They're transformed. That's what the gospel does. Uh, and so I think it's critical to everything. It's not a part of the game. It's not a part of the process. It's, it's, it's everything. Did you want to jump in on, on this one? I, I'll piggyback a little bit off of what Pastor said. I feel Kossi like you soften said. me. I say things so hard, and you make them nice. Um, I love you so much. <laughs> I love you. You are by far my better half. <laughs> and we match. Oh. <laughs> um, but to... Uh, <laughs> uh, Remember, we talked about this. You you want a you want a life partner, yeah. not a sex partner. You, you remember, you want to you want to build the it, intimacy. Is this point much he, he compliments than, her? Yeah, I yeah. Remember. This is <laughs> this is turning into our date night. This is our. I'm so sorry. I've derailed this whole thing. I love you. So to piggyback off of what Pastor Costi said, um, just in the beginning about setting that standard to look for in a husband or wife, it's funny because we just had this conversation with our daughter. She just turned 13, and this last year she spent a lot of time in the concordance just making this list on what to pray for, and she can't wait for marriage. And um, just recently, you probably could jump on this, but uh, Tone took her out for a date, 
And they went through 1 Timothy 3. And although that passage is speaking to deacons, um, a deacon is one who serves under the leadership of the church. And as wives, we want to be married to men who are going to be serving the body. And so it's really interesting. In 1 Timothy 3, it says, he is to be a man of dignity, serious in mind and character, not flippant about important issues. Uh, not double-minded or double-tongued, excuse me, saying one thing to one person and then saying a different thing to another. Uh, he's not addicted to much wine. Uh, he's not fond of sordid gain, so he's not abusing his role to, to make money. Um, he's not, but he is holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So he, Again, he lives by the word of God and isn't tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And um, I also really appreciated what Pastor Bodie said in a sermon he titled, What He Must Be. And he was saying the conversation that he had with his daughter. And uh, he went through what first he must not, what shows that what he, he, if he's not ready to, to lead you. And some pitfalls that women take. And so I'm just going to read that list real quickly. Um, the first half of the sermon says that he, we first uh, fall into a relationship because of lust. Uh, we, it clouds, you know, our judgment. Uh, the, the famous words, you know, but he's so cute. And um, second would be desperation. As the years pass, so do the, the expectations that the woman has. Uh, third would be the time invested. Uh, many times people lunge into marriage because they've spent so much time into a relationship. Fourth would be, uh, let's see here, materialism. He can provide what I need. And then lastly, he goes in to say about mysticism. You know, I've prayed about it, and so now I have peace about it. And uh, I, I love that he said, you know, very clearly, if you're not responding to what the word of God said, then that's not biblical peace. That is your own, uh, your heart being deceived. And then he goes on to say, you know, Ephesians 5, and that he's to lead her in uh, love, lead her in the word, lead her in righteousness, lead her in selflessness and in intimacy, not to be confused with sex, what we were talking about earlier, but rather prioritizing her over the children or his buddies or work. And so whether it be Ephesians 5 or 1 Timothy 3, uh, any other passage or all of the above, I think taking um, God's word as the standard. Johnny, can I jump in? Is that okay? Real quick on that. Jumped in. Just an illustration. Please. She mentioned Peyton Faith in our little date. You know, because we were, she was putting together, she took a whole six months or a year in trying to build this list. You know, we were talking about the list and she's going through concordances and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, one night she ran out. She goes, oh my goodness, there's already a list in the Bible. And she's going through 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. A pastor must be above reproach, husband and wife, temperate, prudent, hospital, respectful, the whole thing. And then we realize, you know, how do you know a man is qualified to be a pastor unless all the men in the church are striving to be at that bar, and then out of those, the qualified men are, are selected. And so we're using, in our home, 1 Timothy 3. That's the list she's written out, and she's looking for a man who fulfills those qualifications. And then for Ethan you know, and, and Zeke, they're doing Proverbs 31. They're, so basically, I guess our long, short answer to the the circuitous route that we took would just be use the Bible as your list. Pull those key texts and then use those as your list. And ladies, if you meet a man that fits 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 8, then you marry him. Men, if you meet a man, uh, men, if you meet a woman who, who meets Wrong Proverbs. Wrong conference. <laughs> We're recording this. Let's just, leave that one I, there. Yeah. I, yeah. Men, if you meet a lady who meets Proverbs 31 and Titus 2, and you, then you know you, you marry her. <laughs> I'm with you. And all those who agree say amen. Amen. Now, I uh, appreciate what you said as far as using the, using the Bible because many of the questions we're asking, it's not rocket science. You, you said use the Bible, and your daughter who's 14 can open up the pages of Scripture and go, man, there's a profound simplicity to what's within God's word that we don't have to really look around in ambiguity and it really leads me to my next question for you guys and we're going to try to get through the next couple in the next five or six minutes or so. Now let's say those things are in order. You're a man who loves the word of God. You're being shaped by God and you see a, a woman or vice versa who's being shaped by God. What is a respectful way to approach her 
and ask her on a date. You know, we live in a, a world, do I call her? Is that too intentional? Do I text her? Is that too casual? Do I ask her to go on a date? Is that freaky? Or do I say you want to hang, question mark? Is that too, you know, like not intentional enough? What do you do? How do we do this in a godly fashion? Costi. We've talked about this before, you know, back home at our church. We've done a couple of dating courtship series on this. And what naturally happens is if a bunch of people around this age and life stage, somewhere between, you know, their teens and into the 30s and all that, young adults, college, singles, all that, you're hanging out at church, inevitably you find each other, right? For us, I'll use a couple of different examples, but we end up at this place called Native or In-N-Out or wherever, and there's always, you know, they find each other, right? They're sitting over there, and it's like group dating, group courtship. They're hanging out, and, you know, they, they're texting each other, saying, hey, how's your classes, whatever. It's all staying pretty, pretty wholesome, and everyone's aware of it, and everyone knows. Well, there's inevitably the next step. What I'm a big fan of, just following the biblical model, is if, guys, you want to you wanna make a move or you want to ask this gal out, well, you can, you can go to her dad and say, hey, I'd like to, to get to know your daughter more. I'd like to step into a courtship process. But if you're not sure if she's interested, if you came and said that to me, I'd go, sure, you're a great guy in our church. What do you think, sweetheart? And my daughter's going, no, no, no. You know, so there, there's like a, a kind of a twofold process here. Do you match a list that she's made biblically? Yes, you match her. So assuming it's all good, I think you got to go right away to the covering and the authority that God, God's given her in her life. And so if the gal and the guy are talking and clearly there's something there, the immediate next step is if there's a father in the picture, we need to go to him. He's the biblical covering. She belongs to no one but the Lord. And then through him, the stewardship given to her father, who is her protective covering and her leader. So we go to dad and we talk to him. And from there, that process begins. If a godly father's not in the picture, which is the case in our ministry, we've talked to young women who that is the case, then a pastor is, is playing the role of a surrogate father, so to, so to speak, where going to the pastor, and that's the whole key. If this young man is serving and he is faithful and he's there, it's such a joy. I think to your point earlier, we've talked about this before offline, the joy, the fun for you is that moment, whether you're doing the wedding or not, we assume that you'll do her wedding, maybe not, maybe I'll do the wedding and you can give her away or you want to do the wedding, that's fine. But whatever the process is, uh, kidding. Overall, the joy, you're not trying to hold her back, you want to give her away to the right person. So as a pastor, I want to play that role if the father's not in the picture, where I'm excited and last thing I'll say on that illustratively is about a year and a half ago, we had a young man who, this guy is the first one there, last one to leave. I kept calling him a future deacon. He's carrying everything all over the campus. He just wouldn't go away constantly. Um, I started making jokes, like thinking like, you ladies are crazy. Like someone picked this guy up here. He's a, a catch. And eventually a young woman and him begin the courtship process. But that's the joy as a pastor. Godly young men, and God, the young women who fit the bill, and it goes to the next step, either father in the home or pastor where a father's not. That's the next step, which I already know is entirely traditional and weird to our modern culture, but it's not you and her, hey, you want to hang? Or we called one of our dating series HMU, hit me up, because that's how what everyone, hit me up. You know, like, who, that's not going to start a biblical process. Romantic, yeah. Yeah, so. Sup, yeah. Yeah, so. So none of that, sliding into DMs and all that stuff like we talked about. No thanks. Father or pastor, next step. So one thing I, you know, I think there's like a misconception at, at certain points where people, especially maybe in a Christian context, think that they might need to know if they want to marry the person before they even start dating on a quest of intentionality. They think they have to have everything dialed before they even approach it. So there's just this prolonged uncertainty. I've been around her. I've never really gotten to know her on a dating level. So as we, um, how do you approach, let's say, a father or a pastor in a way where you just express interest? Is that a, a valid point of departure, just going, hey, I don't know everything at this point, but I just want to tell you, this is what I've observed of this young lady. 
and I'm interested in going, getting to know her more, would that be something that would be acceptable to you? Or are you looking for what are you currently already feeling about her? Does that make sense? Well, I definitely want to hear from you guys as parents. And I'll give my, this is where I believe we're moving from biblical truth, very clear, into personal application. For my home, for the hen home, my conviction is going to be, you're going to be pretty certain and my daughter's going to be pretty certain that this is the type of individual that matches what she's been praying for that we've talked about. And then we're going to enter into that process. I don't like ambiguity. That's just Costi. I have a feeling that Anthony is pretty similar. Uh, we don't, I don't like a lot of confusion and ambiguity. I don't want the heart getting attached. I don't like any weirdness, awkwardness, or floaty, weird limbo phase. So I want to know right up front. Now, it's perfectly normal to be in a group, hanging out, enjoying, getting to know each other. That's what that group process is for, and just being friends in the church for months on end. But if we're going to start that process, yeah, I want to be pretty certain for me in my house that this is the kind of man that we've prayed for. And she's the kind of gal that he and his family have prayed for and enter that with clarity. That would be where I would, I would go. I mean, would you agree? Or is there, is there a phase where he's hanging out in your living room and you're not really sure and Peyton's hopeful, but maybe not like where... You guys really on the same side of the tennis net right now. What does now. it look like? I saw you looking. I would agree with all of that. I, I, I would. Um, I, I do think there is an ambiguity and there's a, there's a gray area. We all feel it, right, in the in-between. Who is this person? And that's why, to, just to go back to the phases, I, I just, I do, I compartmentalize everything into boxes. Uh, I, I want, and, and for everyone here who's going, and a lot of you, your parents, so many people, and let's be fair, I, I want to be sensitive. You come out of homes, we live in a post-Christian America, you're in this room, you come from a broken home, you got a single parent at home, you've never learned, the idea of a nuclear home and all this stuff is so foreign, that really for it to even be enacted, you're going to have to do it on your own. I don't even know who I'm, t actually, no, I've, I've talked with some of you ladies, we came up, we were talking, uh, the gals are going, where are all these Bible men? They don't exist. You know, we were talking earlier, at, and uh, I said, they're at Mission Bible Church, come. And, um, and, and But it is true. We've been raised on Disney, and the society ha has destroyed the idea of, of the home, and there's no modeling. And so women are walking around hearing this stuff, and men too, and going, how in the world do I even begin uh, and I would say it's as simple as setting up those structures of saying, I'll spend the first six months getting to know you with my family involved. The people that love you the most. And if you don't have a good mom or father, then you go to your pastor and in your group of friends from church. And basically, you, in, you, you initiate that relational structure, watching them in a social context. I guarantee after six months in a social context, if you're listening to your friends and to your family, you will know without ambiguity whether this is the type of person you want to pursue that next level with. Use your community the way that God intended you to use your community, and that will remove the ambiguity. Yeah, and, and that's why the importance of a local church is of so much importance. You know, there, almost every answer includes just a, a deep commitment to God's people. And so that I don't ever, I want anybody to miss that. So many of these answers in regards to godly wisdom, godly input, a surrogate father are dependent upon being committed to a church where those things can be observed. Well, I'm so thankful for the wisdom and input that has been here today. Would you guys pray with me? As we conclude our time, and then we just have a final, just some final announcements. Please pray with me. God, we are so thankful, Lord, that your word, Second Peter 1 says, has given us everything we need pertaining to a life of godliness. And so, God, even as Pastor Tony was just saying, there's a little bit of gray. You give us your, your wisdom, Lord, in order to operate in a fashion that is honoring to you. And so I pray, God, that in the process of dating or even in a life of marriage or even in a life of singleness, God, that there would be a great pursuit of honoring and glorifying you. God, ultimately, marriage is a picture of the greatest metaphor in the Bible, and that is of Jesus' love for his church. And so I pray that we would share in that love to love that which you died for and that which you are coming back for. 
We're thankful for the people of God, and we're grateful for the hope of heaven. Help us never to take that for granted. We love you, God, and we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen.